my name is Chris Wharton, and I'm an associate professor in the nutrition program at Arizona State University. And I'm extremely excited to have Jean-Martin Fortier here to, um, to offer this incredible workshop on profitable small-scale farming. Um, this is a, a collaboration that's been months in the making with a lot of organizations, and I want to just call some of them out now. So Kelly Young, for example, at U of A Cooperative Extension uh, helped put this on along with Steadfast Farms and Eric Schultz, um, and a number of other folks are contributing to this event. So I just want to make mention of one of the other organizations involved in this workshop. It's called the Food Systems Transformation Initiative. And so this is a new organization at ASU. It's, it's one that I direct. And it's really focused on broadly equitable participation in the food system. And that means we really care about food security and people's ability to have access to healthy, oftentimes locally produced, culturally appropriate, affordable food. But it's also about ensuring that people can have livelihoods in the food system. And so this event is really an important piece of that. We really care about having an integrated and diverse food system and allowing people to have the opportunity to be producers and participate in the food system from that perspective as well. The other part I want to get into, so there's fertility, that's one part. The other part is, again, soil structure. Okay, so you need to take care that you're doing intensive spacings, you might having more than one crop, you will be having more than one crop per year, three or four in, in this kind of climate. So fertility matters, but also soil structure. Okay, so we haven't worked the soil for more than 10 years with a rotor tiller, and I'll talk about that. And when we did the soil analysis two years ago, it was amazing we had 12 inch of really nice brown soil. No layers, okay? And our best teacher has always been the earthworm. Thinking in terms of if I, if I was an earthworm, would I like this right now or wouldn't I? Okay? And these guys have given me the scope of trying to move away from mechanical tillage and go towards biological tillage, trying to see if the way we work the fields could not destroy their habitat. And back then, my, my idea was that, could we figure out ways to do things where we would count on them to do that work? That's what really was behind some of the tools that we have uh, took into our system. The first one being the broad fork. Everybody knows what the broad fork is? Does anybody know what it's not? Or, <laughs> that was a funny way of saying things. Okay, so the broad fork is a big U-bar that you plant into the soil, and it has tines that allows you to open up the soil, but without overhauling it, without turning it over. So you bring air into the soil, you decompact it, you loosen it up, but you're not destroying the habitat of the earthworms. You're allowing deep tillage, but in a very gentile way. Okay? So broad forking on an acre and a half, broad forking 100 foot beds. A lot of people say, you know, JM, that's, that's a lot of work. And then they'll have problem with the broad forks. Broad forking, it's so hard, it's not sure it's, I'm not sure it's a good tool. If you're having problem broad forking, you should be broad forking, okay? <laughs> the tool is not the issue, okay? Rotor tillers. When we started market gardening, that was the only tool that we had, okay? We thought it was amazing. You put a rotor tiller on a BCS two-wheel tractor and you go and you'll have 10 inch of really loose soil. You can stick your whole hand into it. And you're thinking, wow, if I was a root, I'd be happy. It's a perfect system for intensive spacings. One thing, you take soil that has nice aggregates, okay? You know, for, soil is formed by balls and soils, has structure. You're putting everything in a blender and you're pulverizing it to, into finer pieces. So at first glance, soil is loose. Come back a week or two later, what happens? It's 
compacts. This is physics. So you're taking soil that has structure and you're destructuring it. If you're, using, if you're using the rotor tiller once a year and you're putting a lot of organic matter, it's not a big deal. But if you're cleaning up your beds and if you're preparing three or four beds a year and that's the only tool you'll have, it won't take long for your soil to be really, really dry. I wouldn't say dead, that's not the right word, but really compact and really hard to work into. So we've quickly moved away from this tool and replaced it with a harrow, a power harrow which has tines on a vertical shank. So instead of mixing, you know, of, of turning the soil upside down, it mixes like that. Okay? So you're not inverting the layers and you're not bringing seeds from the bottom up, which is the other thing, that the other drawback from the rotor tiller. So a harrow on the first few inch of the soil. When we were looking for one, super expensive back then for a small tractor, that's how we paid. And it has a roller in the back, or harrow, that allows to firm the seed bed and allows to quickly adjust the depth of, 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 our, of the work. We want to be working on an inch, sometimes two inch, when we're transplanting, and we want the tines to work really slow. Okay? Are you getting the nuance here between the tiller and the harrow? Not saying that you should have this absolutely and the tiller is bad. Not saying that saying that if you want to be sustainable on the long run, it's a good option to have another approach than just tilling. Because there's drawbacks to using the tiller. Okay? So, perfectly conditions the seedbed by leveling, by firming, and by mixing the first layers. Really, really great tool. So one of the great things about these walk-behind tractors is that you can change the implements. So you can have different, many, many different tools. Some fit in the front, some fit in the back. You can play with your spacing. This is a quick attach system. It takes a minute to change the tools. So you have a versatile power unit which can motorize many different tools. You can hang out and go to town. <laughs> go make your deliveries that way. These are really popular in Italy because they have small space and they have hilly slopes. But again, working on permanent bed systems, 30 inch, it's going to be hard to find better than that. They're very different from some of the old uh, rotor tillers that used to be around because you can swift, you can swing the handlebars from one side to, other, to the other. And lastly, and I always need to be careful about how I say things, everyone on the farm can use it. Okay? So even, even the girls. Not supposed to say that. It's not too heavy. You can maneuver it. And it does make a difference because, and again, in a traditional setup, it's always the guys that are running the tractors. And you know, tractors, they're not so, you know, it's, it's, it's impactful to be driving a tractor and, you know, looking in the back and clutching over many years. So, not saying this is, this is better, just saying this works. Okay? And you can get a tan <laughs> while you work. Okay. I forgot that was there. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so we used to make our beds with a shovel. You know, when I started the farm, we did 180 bed with a shovel. 
but I knew I would only do it once to shape the beds. But every other year, they tend to settle down. So we need to re-raise them. And now we use what's called a rotary plow. So it's a big screw that just shoots the bed from the aisles, um, the soil from the, from, the, from the aisles onto the bed. Rotary plow. And so we re-raise the beds, we use a harrow, and then we have permanent beds that are ready to be seated in, transplanted, whatever. If you look at the picture though, it looks pretty damn clean. And you would wonder, how did you do this? Did you, did you rotor till everything? Did you, did you put herbicides? You know, it looks pretty damn clean. And the answer is here. We use tarps to prepare the seed beds. And I came across this a bit by chance many years ago. I was tarping some of my beds in my hoop houses because I didn't want to have weeds pop in while the beds weren't used. I was covering the soil. And what I, what I noticed was that the beds that had been covered with a tarp had a lot less weed pressure in them. Okay, Growing two crops side by side, one crop didn't have any weed pressure and the one had more. And the explanation is pretty simple. The tarp creates perfect germinating condition. It's dark, it's moist, and it's warmer. So all the dormant weed seeds, what happens? They germinate. And then what happens? They die because there's no light. So this is called occultation. And it's an amazing way to get rid of the weeds because you're not doing anything. I got pretty excited about that. And so I bought some big kick-ass tarps and started to cover whole field box, thinking I'll get rid of the weeds. So one thing leading to the other, we noticed that when we would remove the tarps, man, this, the beds were ready to go. All of this, all of the leftover residues, all of the weeds, Everything had disappeared. This was bare soil, ready to be planted in, and it hadn't been worked. And that got us really excited. Because there we were, we found a solution to preparing soil without overhauling it, without disturbing the ecology of the soil. Yes. So. We use the tarps for two to three weeks, depending on the temperature. Sometimes it's four weeks when it's a cold spring. And it also depends what's coming afterwards or what's coming next. So it's, we've tried to systemize this as much as possible in the farm, but sometimes you, you need to have a window between two crops. But it works really well. And it also allows us to have most of the site under control. And I'll talk more about that later on. Okay? So permanent beds, tarped, broad fork for deep tillage without inverting the layers, and using a machine to shallowly prepare the soil for the seed beds without playing with too much soil. You know, remember there was $260 of gas for the BCS? That's, that's how we go about it. Just by using these techniques, we don't rely on big machines to prepare soil. Yes? Well, we don't use the BCS. For, for every bear that we prepare, I'll show you what, what the sequences are. Okay, so these are the tarps. They're UV-treated silage tarps. So they're food grade. They won't disintegrate. In the, in the sun, they, they'll, they'll last for, you know, I've had them for more than 10 years, and, and they work. Take, try it at home, you'll be flabbergasted. It makes a big, di make, makes a big difference. So. The only drawback is that they're heavy, okay? So, need to move them around, it might take a long time. What we've come up with is just to buy more of them so each field block has its own. 
a tarp, a 40 by 100 tarp can cost $200, $300. It's going to cover seven, eight beds. It's a worthwhile investment. Okay? So tarping, we could be called a tarp farm because we do a lot of that. It's just like putting a cover crop, but you're doing it, boom, one shot, and you're leaving it for two or three weeks. So this is the sequence of the bet preparation on our farm. Okay, so I, we're pretty, my crew is pretty fast. So the beds are tarped, so they're clean. No more work to be done. Now, every other year, I want to raise them again. So I'll use my rotary plow connected to the BCS. That's not too far. I want to raise it an inch or two. Okay? So just to make sure that my soil is really deep and loose, I'll use my broad fork. Okay? And you see how fast it goes in the soil? That's when you have good soil structure, broad forking. It wasn't like that when I started. Okay? But because we've been developing the biology in the soil by not turning it over, and because we're using the broad fork to create the right conditions for the habitat, we're populating the soil. Okay? I don't remember. That's been, that's two years ago. Okay, so now we've moved away from relying on a lot of compost because our soils are really filled with organic matter and we're using vermicompost. So usually I'll put two or three buckets. So vermicompost, worm casting is very potent. It's a, it's a rich way to fertilize. It has a lot of microorganisms. And then the last step before putting the crops in is to use my power harrow and just perfectly condition the seed bed. Mixing in the soil amendment firming it, leveling it. See how there's an offset so I'm not walking on the bed here. And this is working on an inch or uh, an inch or two. Okay. So that's how we do the bed prep on the farm. And this is not a no-till system but it's definitely a minimal tillage system. And if I was an earthworm, and I was there during all that video, life is not so bad, okay? The other thing that I've learned through my research about tarps is that you're also creating the perfect habitats for earthworms. Because earthworms, they wanna have soil that is covered because they don't want to get pecked by birds. They want to have moist conditions and that's what the tarps do. And When you remove them, if you left something for them to eat, organic matter, crop residues, whatever, they're there. And you're enhancing their habitat by tarping. So then if you do this, then you don't want to be destroying it right afterward using a tiller. So this is our approach to it. And in the greenhouse, since it's not really easy to maneuver with the walk-behind tractor, we use what's called a, a tilter, which is a battery-powered small cultivator that works on the first inch or half inch of the soil. So same thing, it was tarped, it was broad forked, and then I'm firming the soil, you know, leveling it and um, mixing the amendments using this battery-powered uh, tool.
No, that's from Johnny's. Johnny's Selected Seeds makes that tool. $500. So if you have a home garden, that's an option. The tool is 15 inch, so two pass, 30 inch, again, standardized. So that's how we do the bed prep in the greenhouse and tunnels. Okay? Questions for that? So it's a very different way of working the soil, but it gives good results. Yes? Which, which one, you said the rotor, yeah, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a screw, and it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a great question. Occultation, solarization. When you're putting clear plastic, what you're doing is raising the temperature of your soil to the extent of your destroying the weed seeds. That's why you want to do that. Okay, so if you put clear plastic in the summer, in your climate, for four weeks, you're going to cut out on lots of your weeds. It, that would be a great thing to do in the summer here, especially if you're growing in the winter. The difference between occultation is that when you're solarizing, you're not creating hospitable habitat for the life. Because obviously you're going to fry them, so they're they're migrating down. They, they, they're probably going to come up, but when you're tarping, it's like mulching. You're just you're just creating the right habitat for all the microorganisms in the soil. So sometimes it's better to solarize. Sometimes it's better to use tarps. It's just different tools in your toolbox, and then it's up to you to figure out what works best. Okay. Is that clear with everyone? Okay, so this is the rotor, this is the flail mower. We use this tool to, to destroy all of the cover crops and to the crop to, to, to cut up the green, the crop residues. So instead of working like a, a lawn mower with a blade like that, it has lots of little blades working that way. So it chops up the residues and just leaves a mulch in the back. This is important because we want to get rid of this material and we want the biology of the soil to get rid of it and if we shred it down into finer particles, we speed up that process. Okay, it's going to be digested faster. So for many years, you know, I, you, I don't know if you've noticed the nuance, but I've talked about cover crops. And most people will talk about green manure, okay? Because if you're growing legumes, they'll fix the nitrogen from the air, bring it into the soil, and then when you bring that cover crop, or the green manure, those plants, in your soil, you're adding nitrogen to your soil. So we've never relied on green manure to fertilize because we're using compost, and it's been, it's been working great for us. And I was always concerned by the fact that if I need to integrate the plant material in the soil using a rotor tiller, then I'm tilling and destroying the habitat of the soil. So on one hand, there's a benefit because you're, or you're adding green residues into your soil, but on the other hand, you're plowing or rotor tilling. And so I was like, what's the, what's the deal? And what we came up with doing was to, instead of incorporating into the soil, we're simply burying the green manure with the soil from the aisle. So we go with our rotary plow, we take, we take the dirt from the pathways and then we shoot it onto the green manure and we leave it to decompose there. Yeah, and so this, by doing it this way, we're getting the benefit of, of the green manure, but we're not disturbing the ecology of the soil, okay? 
We'll want to keep our aisles clean because because of our raised beds, our tool, our, our flail mower doesn't really work well here. And sometimes these are hard to destroy. So at one point, we'll leave them bare. And this is a picture of, uh, I thought there would be the green manure there, but they're not. So forget about this. I have another drawing where all the green manures are systematically put into the crop planning calendar. OK, so it's noon, but I propose that we go on for another 15 minutes for the break. Are you guys cool with that? Are you guys cool with that in the back, the guys that are preparing the food? 15 minutes? No, if, if we go on for 15 more? Okay. So we talked about the margins in the morning, 45%. A big part of it is because our overheads have been pretty, pretty small. We rely on most of the work, me and my wife, so we don't have a big crew. But also all of the tools that we use were bought the first year and basically, they're inexpensive tools. So simple, but yet they're well designed and they do the work in a great way. So this is a breakup of all the investment that we've made the first few years. First year, actually, we bought everything once. And it came to under $40,000. Perhaps these numbers are a bit off now, I don't know. But the fact was, that we borrowed 40,000 on five years at 10%, which was around $8,000 a year payback. And we were grossing close to $100,000. So really, it wasn't a lot for us to get going. So worthwhile investments. So some of these tools, perhaps some of you guys know these. These are the cedars that we've started with, um, the Ertway. Pretty versatile cedars. It's not very efficient. It's not very precise. A lot of thinning goes into using that cedar. There's another cedar called the Glazer. Both of them are sold by Johnny's Collected Seeds. And the Glazer works really well with small seeds, round seeds, carrots, turnips, which really don't work well with this cedar. Okay? The small seeds, they tend to jam in the mechanisms. So, but these, this one works good for big seeds. So the, both of them together for under $200 or $300, you can go around and, and direct seed pretty much everything. This is another cedar called the Jang cedar, made in Korea. It's, it's a definitely better cedar, more precise, more versatile, more expensive, takes longer to calibrate. So if you have five or six different crops that you're seeding, you're gonna spend a lot of time figuring this out as you go. But if you need to buy only one, and you're doing, you know, I don't know, 100 CSA, this is the seeder that you wanna have. When we're seeding, we're always measuring how much seeds we're depositing in the soil. Because you know, you're, you're going like that and you're hoping for the best, but if it didn't work, or if it jammed, or if it's, you know, the, the shoe is open too much, and you're dropping five times more cedar, it's going to take you two weeks to figure it out when things pop up or don't pop up. So what we do is we have a little protocol where we measure the seed packet before and after we've seeded, and that gives us the amount of seed that was put in the ground. And we have targets that we, that we know because, you know, we've planted carrots on a 100-foot bed, and we figure out there was perfect spacing measure the amount of seed, that's our target. So if, if, I've put it, if I've put too much seed, I have an indicator that tells me I need to calibrate it better. If I hadn't poof, if I have not enough seed, then I'll know and I'll do a second pass. So simple stuff, but these little details make a difference. Six row cedar, we use this for intensive salad spacings for mescaline that we grow on the farm. So it has six rows, so it'll be 12 rows on 30 inch. And this is a picture of a roller that also is sold by Johnny's. 
This is an important tool if you don't have a roller in the back of, let's say, a harrow or something, because for all of these cedars to work, you need to have soil that is really loose. So the, all the big clunks need to be uh, disintegrated. That's why we're talking about shallowly cultivating. The soil needs to be firmed so that when you roll the cedar, it has traction and it needs to be leveled so that you won't have dip where things grow faster or shorter and when you're harvesting, because uniformity when you're harvesting is important. So this ensures that. You also want to be marking your rows. They don't need to be straight rows, but they need to be parallel. Like, let's say these are not straight because probably somebody was talking to me while I was working. It's like, whoa. But you want to be seeding in parallel rows because the next step is to be cultivating for weeds. And you'll be doing so with hoes. And you need to make sure that when you're cultivating one row, you're not destroying seeds that are emerging in the other rows. So everything needs to be symmetrical. And that's really important because well, when you're cultivating with a hoe and you want to do it if efficiently, you're eyeballing only one row okay, to go fast. And you need to assume that you're not destroying. Because sometimes we do this when the seeds are only starting to germinate. 